What is Adolphus? That's the question you're probably asking yourself right now, and I get that, because this turn-based MMORPG is not very famous. The company behind it makes questionable decisions, the player base is declining, I mean, all those things make the game sound lame, because it kinda is, but that's not the point. This game was a huge part of my childhood. It has a beautiful world to explore, different cultures, different classes. I mean, you can literally play as an alcoholic panda, a person that can spawn portals, an old guy that's part of the 1%, and a furry. This game really has it all. I mean, there's different dimensions, gigantic krakens, a guy with fire for hair. I mean, his cut is lit. So I wanted to give exploring this intricate world one more shot and prove to all the people that have only played WoW or RuneScape or maybe played this game 10 years ago that it's terribly underrated. So I created a new team with the gigantic goal of reaching level 100 in 100 days. And the adventure starts in Incarnam, a floating island so yellow it makes Mexican TV shows look like black and white movies. Coincidentally, it's also the beginner area of the game. So while I complete the tutorial, let me try and speedrun the basics of this dumpster fire game. I'm playing on four separate instances of the game, because this game is simply made for team play and I don't have any friends. Somehow I thought that would sound funny and not sad. As you can see this game is top down, and the map is split up in different point and click screens. Yet for some reason I still rest my hands on WASD. Anyway, lastly in combat, when it's your turn, you can move a limited number of cells and use your spells with your action points. With gear and level ups you'll get tons of options in combat, but we'll get to that later. And oh, would you look at that, the tutorial is over. So now, time to explore Inker and I left immediately. I know what you're asking yourself. Did you get a haircut? I have been working on this video since 2021. No, but I get if you're confused. I mean, this chapter is called Incarnam. But just to make the experience up there a little more bearable, I went down to the mainland to kill some cute birds. They're a few levels higher, but pretty weak. So they're good for getting a few levels at the start. But they also drop these cute hats made out of their remains. Once my team was covered in dead birds for those sweet stats and questionable moral values, I took the portal back up and it was time to explore Incarnam. For real this time. While we're up here, there's a couple things we want to get done. First, finish every quest for money and XP. Beat the game's first dungeon that's located in the cemetery and generate some money from selling the resources we collect up here along the way. We'll start off tackling some of the 27 quests. This sounds a lot, but obviously at this stage of the game, they're very simple. Here's an example. Ah oh man, I got like a rat in my basement or whatever. I put down some yummy lemonade to bait out the rat. Oh, there it is. And it's dead. Oh, thank you so much. You're a real one. The end. I obviously won't go into detail on all of them. I think you'd agree this video is long enough already. All you need to know about them is that some have to do with fighting local mobs, some with exploring and talking to people, and some are related to crafting and getting to know the basic professions, which we will hardly ever use in this challenge. Wait, why does the music keep getting louder? Is, uh, oh, oh shit, it's a quest montage! What a wild ride. So now we've only got but a few quests left. Most of which, coincidentally, have to do with us visiting this. And if you don't have the memory of a goldfish, you'll remember we want to beat the dungeon in the. Therefore, I make my way over and talk to Corpse Sword the Gravedigger. If there's one redeeming quality about the game, it's the names. Anyway, Corpse Sword gets us to the dungeon. Dungeons in Dofus usually have five rooms. 
Every room has four predefined monsters you have to beat to reach the next room. Clear all five rooms with the last one containing the dungeon boss and you beat the dungeon. Since I'm level 17 by now, the first four rooms do not present much of a challenge. There's this weird skeleton theme going on here. I mean, probably because this place is uh, a um, graveyard, right? <laughs> that was the word, I, I forgot. Seven. I make it to the boss room and the action filled boss fight starts. Content about turn based games is hard. Boom, bam, bop, pow. That's better. We did it! I finished the last few quests, some lore stuff, don't worry about it. Then I sell some resources as a form of our get rich quick scheme, and we're done. Of course, this was the smallest portion of the game, but it's the first step towards a massive adventure that waits for us. So now we make our way down to the city below, Astra. It's day 4 and we're already at level 19. Now, you may be thinking, this challenge is clearly going to be a cakewalk over-dramatized for YouTube. You're very wrong. Because there's a hidden objective in this challenge that I have yet to explain. But also, I got a fast influx of XP from the achievements in this game. That's right, not even Steam games can compare with the sheer amounts here. We got them for completing quests, defeating monsters, the dungeon. But then isn't it still kind of easy to get level 100? Let me send this over to Professor Bob Amos to explain. Hi, Professor Bob Amos here. I want to explain the Dofus level curve to you. Did you know that Bama's characters now have a total of over 142,000 XP? Quite a lot, right? Well, obviously every level in Dofus takes more and more XP as you go. So to reach the goal of level 100, he will actually need 95 million XP. And currently he's only 0.1% there, seeing as the challenge is already 4% over, not a good trajectory. Of course, higher level monsters will later also grant more experience, but this is where the hidden objective comes in, which is actually the hardest challenge in the game, even for veterans having fun. Good meme, I know, I know, but actually, hear me out. Because in this game, you can literally pay people to instantly get you to super high levels. You can trick the AI of high level mobs to outsmart them and immediately inflate your levels. There's these stupid techniques to gain money, like buying things percent off in bulk and then reselling it. It's a whole thing and it's made this game kind of like not the same as it was. So I want to experience this game for real. Go on a real adventure again. This means I'm not playing just to have optimized leveling and the fastest XP curve. This is why this video is still challenging. Speaking of challenging, it is actually quite challenging for me to try and explain what I did on day four because not even I have any idea because I accidentally recorded my face full screen. And then the game server was on backup. But then, then I did one of the Astro dungeons, again quite easily, because at this stage the game isn't supposed to be difficult. Which leads me to the Astro goals. Complete the four Astro dungeons, upgrade our gear, and finish all the quests for achievement completion. Sounds easy, but it's going to take a lot more time. That's because Astro contains not only the city, which in itself is about the size of Incarnam, but also the forest, the fields, beach, quarry, meadow, cemetery, Tynella, and underground sewers. Yeah, lots to do, because even that is just such a tiny fraction of this entire game. For now, I headed to the beach to take on the Sandy Castle dungeon, which is the closest thing to a copyright infringement we've had so far. This is clearly a fairly odd parents reference. I make my way through the dungeon and it's still pretty boring and easy, so I'll save you the details. 
The literal most interesting thing about this boss is that he can heal. That's how advanced the mechanics are by this point. By the way, I'm doing these dungeons first because those really get you levels quick. So then the lengthy quests will be a little easier. And that being said, we're already heading to the third dungeon, baby. The Royal Gobble's Court. Sounds exotic until you realize Gobble is just a fancy word for a sheep. But then again, Sheep Dungeon does suck as a name, so uh, I don't blame them. This dungeon is where fights slowly start to take longer, which will also make the challenge harder as we go on, because a single dungeon can easily take up a day or two if I fail to beat it a couple times. I am definitely not foreshadowing. Thankfully though, again we make it through quite well and reach level 34. With three dungeons done and our characters still covered in tiny bird remains, it's about time our gear gets a little better. There's not so much to go into depth, depth with yet, that, that word fucking sucks to say. Depth. Depth. Ugh. So I'll explain the items and what they do later. For now, know that our HP goes up from 200 something to 300 something and that our damage output sharply increases. After that quick intermission, we begin chipping away the quests. It's a lot of running back and forth, small quest fight here and there, not much to talk about so far. But oh wait, it's a quest that's weird and annoying and this video is officially here for me to vent about it now. We talk to this cat that calls us a little young to visit a different dimension. Fair enough. But we insist to go and the guy gives up immediately and lets us go there anyway. Cool enough, but now he wants us to get rid of these little Eka fleas, these tiny weak buggers, while he sets up the telescope to show us some cool stuff around here. Newsflash, those six-legged demons are not tiny weak buggers. There are three fights to do and you have to do them alone. What does that mean? Well, it means I have to do 12 fights in total for this small, stupid, quest. Plus, I actually die a couple times because they do a ton of damage for the level. So this whole thing alone costs me 40 minutes. Anyway, I love MMORPGs. Also, I finally make it. And what do I get? A teaser for even more of these idiots to look forward to. You know, for later. With a couple more quests completed, we reach level 40. The minimum level for the final dungeon in Astra. You see, the whole theme is that you fight tiny bugs living in your walls. And to go fight them, you need to equip a staff that makes you their size. And that staff has a level 40 requirement. This dungeon really is no joke. I actually died in the third room, which was my first death, I think. Then I make it though, and thankfully, due to the way the map is set up, the fourth room is doable too. But then, it's time for the boss. Surprisingly enough, it was quite doable. The skill ceiling isn't that high in the early game, of course, but there's gonna be more spicy stuff later. Here what really helped was being able to focus down one enemy after the other with the combined might of my characters, which left the boss fully unprotected. As we all know, 1v4 is awfully unfair, unless your name is Dream, of course. Now all we have to do is finish the Astro quests. So the next few days, I continue chipping away at these often tiring running tasks with one especially grinding my gears. The quest, Things We Lost in the Forest, leads you to talk to and protect a character called Van Guy. The problem here is that you enter a single player fight with him against some overpowered mobs for your level. The funny twist is that he can give you some really strong buffs every so often, preventing you from dying and sharply raising your damage output. What's the problem you ask? You fail if he dies and he only buffs you. So fighting all these mobs results in a race against the clock. Something I have to do on all four characters. And after one of them failed to complete the objective, I had to walk all the way back to the forest to retry. Another 40 minutes of my life, I'll never get back. So you see, in Astrup is when quests can begin to be really lengthy. Like, I didn't even mention the part of the quest where you follow various hints to the forest that are not indicated on the map. Meaning you have to search around aimlessly or Google it, and then also walk back and forth from city center to forest. Yeah, told you having fun was hard. As the days progress, some of the last quests take us to the Astrip Cemetery. Here's where we face some consistently pretty challenging fights, but we're able to get by thanks to me playing for characters. Alone? You're really screwed. All this being done, there's only a few loose ends for me to tie up, which results in me finishing all of Astrip on day 13. And the neat part that I haven't told you about yet, some of the quests in Incarnum and Astrup are part of the main storyline. Yes, there's a main storyline, and it's about locating and collecting these ancient dragon eggs, 
which is actually pretty cool once you get to it later in the game. Anyway, for starters, after finishing Astrup, the tiny dragon Ratha Thrusk entrusts you with guarding the Silver Dofus. For the record, there's a bunch of these eggs in the game, but there's only six of the legendary eggs. The Silver Dofus is just a cool small goodie with a neat effect. One time per fight, if you are under 20% HP at the start of your turn, you get a 20% heal. And with that, we end off Astrup at a clean level 50. Looking to finally extend the horizon past the confines of this small starter world. With our sights set on a weird island shaped like a carrot. I, I mean, carrot. Let me get a... Uh... Excuse the oo speak, but there's a lot coming, so brace yourself. It's literally called Wabbit Island, inhabited by the Wabbits that all speak like this part of a burger bun. You know, like a bottom. That was a really bad joke. Though, before I get to put you through that hell, level 50 is a great milestone to regear my team and make sure they do the most damage possible. So I plan out the new sets, got all the resources needed and then had them crafted for me. So what do all these items actually do? Let me give you the rundown. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago the four nations, I am kidding. Okay, let's pray this joke doesn't get me copyright strike. But for real, these four elements exist in Dofus and damaging spells do damage in different elements. So usually you choose one or two elements that you put your stats into because beyond that, you would usually end up with so little damage in all the elements that it'd be way better to get four times as much in one element. Anyways, besides that, I already mentioned movement points and action points. These are crucial because being able to use a spell once or twice a turn obviously makes a huge difference. More movement also gives you a ton of options, lining up combos better or escaping enemies behind walls. Beyond that, the stats are what you'd assume to find. There's resistances, HP, crit chance, range, and a bunch more that don't really matter because you get the point, you've played video games before. So with that, let me present my fully geared characters. My strength and intelligence hopper mage where strength increases earth and intelligence increases fire damage. In combat, her spells place runes on the target that can be procced by using another element on the enemy to increase damage or debuff. My intelligence, healing, Osamotus. Osas are summoners, specifically, I spawn small healing dragons. So he's usually all the way in the backline. My agility craw that deals air damage. This is the typical archer class. She has insane damage output at high ranges. Very good in PvE. My chance for water damage, Pandawa. This guy literally gets drunk during battles and occasionally pukes on enemies when necessary. This guy is a debuffer and positioner as well as a damage dealer. And these are my four characters. Excuse me for waiting so long to introduce them to you. It didn't really make sense when all they had was like three spells and four items to choose from. But equipped with a brand new set that left me totally broke, now we're talking. We can and have to finally get a little strategic in our battles. Off to Wabbit Island. Okay, I'm doing it again. I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. Y you see, there's a lot of interesting quests on Wabbit Island, but they're more aimed at level 60 chats, I, I mean chars. So you see where the problem lies. So instead we'll have a little pre-adventure. <coughs> level 60 actually holds some great power spikes too. So let's get to it. As you can see, I'm battling some Goombas on drugs right now. That's because there's a problem staying with us for the rest of this adventure. Money. If you have a ton of it, 
you can have the most insane equipment. It's as extreme as being born into a rich family in real life. And even if you don't want the best of the best, it can still be hella expensive, which is why a lot of people stop playing this game as well. That part is like the shrinking middle class. But I'm not quitting, because these enemies drop some pretty valuable resources. That's why I spent some good time farming them. If you're still following that analogy, this part is like killing the rich kids for their lunch money. No, wait. I get why people say I'm bad at analogies now. After a while, I moved on, because the best thing to do for the money and XP are still dungeons. You see, there's achievements for every dungeon boss. These include additional challenges, like restrictions on spells or movement. If you complete them, you get a big chunk of XP and the boss's resources, which you can imagine usually sell for a lot. There's a few more dungeons we can beat, and I'm starting on the skeleton dungeon. I'll skip the first four rooms, as usually nothing interesting happens there. Instead, I'll show you how the achievements work on this dungeon boss. We'll have to beat the Ronin Kaffir first and use every movement point we have every turn. These ones are quite easy. All I have to watch out for is not landing on a cell next to an enemy. Since then I get locked and my movement is impaired. Oh, but I do manage to do the other achievement. Moving on, we visit the haunted house dungeon. The difficulty on this boss is that you have to kill him last for a challenge. The tricky thing with that is that as long as he's alive, he revives his fallen teammates, which, you know, would want to make you kill him first. Um, so I died, but that seems to have taught me a lot because I then make it through the fight very well. Focus and positioning makes a huge difference, even without you leveling or having better stats. I'm by no means an expert of this game. So figuring out fights that are a little tougher or have certain challenges is still super satisfying. After this, I yet again put my focus on Kamas. That's the name of the currency, by the way. I want to make sure I have the money for some sweet upgrades when I hit level 60. So I turn to something a bit different. You could call it controlled gambling. You see, I level up my tailor profession quite a bit crafting random stuff, but the stuff I craft isn't quite random. You see, there's a maging system in the game. I'm not sure if anything like this exists in other MMOs, but essentially it means that you use runes that give certain stats like plus five vitality or plus one strength, and you apply these to your gear. You mage them. And by that, you can improve them by a crazy amount. But for this system to work, you obviously also need to somehow get these runes. That's where this weird looking fella called a crusher comes in. Put equipment into it and it destroys it, but gives you runes with the stats of the item. You still following? Essentially, this is my current plan. Crush gear that gives a higher value of runes than the costs of crafting them. Make no mistake, this isn't easy because the crafting costs for gear fluctuates and so do the rune prices. And what also fluctuates is the amount of runes you get from the items. This depends on the amount of times the item has been crushed recently, which you can't know unless you crush it yourself. You're brain smoking right now? Sorry. I'm sure Bob's high explanation skills would have helped out here, but so are his rates. Anyway, I crushed for a while with fluctuating results. The next day, I head to quite a hard early game dungeon, the Quaqua's Nest. The boss has a lot of HP, but the twist is that besides summoning smaller birds, he's got a ton of resistances, which makes it incredibly hard to kill. So by the time I got to the boss room, I realized I can't focus on any additional challenges and achievements if I want to beat this boss. Doing this though, I managed to beat it first try. This kind of results in me having to put the efforts of trying to achieve the challenges against the value of the XP those give, but also the time it may take if I fail the fight and have to redo it. So you see, it's a whole thing. The next dungeon on the other hand, the Tofu House, was a way bigger success story. The bad Tofu is usually quite annoying. He has a lot of movement points and he's a Batman reference. Due to the challenges, you can always only end your turn on the cell you started in. Really shitty when you are a low range, low level character that can't hit across the map. But I figured I'd try to do the challenges anyway and if they were too hard, I guess I'd have to redo the fight. Not to myself, edit out the part where I mess up on my first turn. So on my first try, I wanted to clear up the two mobs that go into melee range first. And then I messed up the challenge again! So on my first try, I wanted to clear up the two mobs that go into melee range first, since they are easiest to focus down. From there, reaching the other two idiots got extremely hard. Thanks to my Osa's healing, 
I was able to survive through all their ranged attacks. And after 12 turns of moving with all 4 characters and 20 minutes of pure concentration, I made it through the fight without screwing anything up. An achievement I'm seriously proud of because not messing up challenges for that long is easier said than done, especially on my first try. Bro, where are you looking at? Hello, the camera's over here. Dude, are you fucking serious? I recorded all of this in one go and then I realized, watching this back, I just say something to the fucking side monitor where I had OBS open. Am I stupid? Jesus Christ. After this, I took yet another dungeon break. I wanted to actively find another mob I could farm around my level that would drop an expensive resource. I found the usual suspects, the type of resources that always sell well because of the crafts they're used for, when I stumbled upon something. You see, the level 42 to level 50 raw mobs can have a 100% chance of dropping a big cannonball. Well, this item usually has a 1% drop rate from a different mob that people do not farm often. The trick is, you need to have a certain prerequisite to get this 100% drop rate. Otherwise, you can't get the item from him at all. To put this into perspective, one of these cannonballs currently sell for 10,000 kamas. If I get one of those for each Raul mobs I fight for all of my four characters, that is an insane amount of profit. Like, my last setup rate for all characters costs 600,000. Depending on the mob I fight, I could make that money back in 10 fights or so that each last a few minutes. So of course, there's now only one question. How do you get that 100% drop rate? Because clearly, not a lot of people know about it. And how would they? It's not explained in the game when you hover over it. But I got the power of Google, baby. There's this place called Odomai Island. You can only go there by talking to an NPC. Captain Haddock and Roll. Before letting you go there though, he requires you to bring him two elite Kefir arrowheads, one fox fighter ear, one sesame oil, and one big cannonball. So, to make getting that 1% drop a little easier, a mob in a nearby area gets a temporary 100% drop rate of this item as long as the quest is active. Of course, that nearby mob being Raul mobs. Naturally, I picked the quest up having zero intention of actually completing it and make my way over to the beaches of Sufokia to beat up some Raul mobs. Also, I'm really sick of saying that name. A lot of farming later and I was able to get my hands on 88 big cannonballs. At the current rate that equals 880,000 kamas. But there was time to end for now because even as is, selling all these items in a dead game takes quite a while. Now while everything I got is selling, it's time to finish all level 50 dungeons. First up is the Scarra dungeon. The most interesting thing about this fight was the challenge clean hands. To deal with moral consequences, as the name says, all enemies need to be killed through indirect means. So either by being pushed, poisoned, or by letting your summons do the work for you. Took a bit, but not so bad. Then I, ironically enough, finished the big cannonball quest to make it to the tropical Odomai Island. I will stop here isn't very long though, as we go and beat up the Correlator dungeon real quick and head out once again. Back to Ankama, I want to beat up the smith's chest. But here we gotta pause, because this dungeon is by no means impossible, but because of my eagerness, it kinda is. You see, the smith's chest does global damage to all your characters, depending on the damage it has taken in the fight. So naturally, one challenge is to kill it first, super hard, while the other mobs are still there, guarding it in the backlines, since it can attack you from anywhere. The other one is Nomad, which again, requires me to use all my MP every turn without getting locked by an enemy. But that is still not all. My big brain self equipped idols. What are those? I know, essentially there's a ton of them and each gives you a certain idol score. And that score increases your XP and loot from battles. The catch? It buffs your enemies. So essentially, 
I made the fight as hard as could be. On attempt one, I didn't even get to move my <gasps> panda. He died before it was his turn. I then immediately failed one of the challenges and gave up quickly after. Then I watched my HP slowly regenerate as I contemplated how stupid it is to make this so hard on myself. But for some reason, I went again. This time, I positioned myself very aggressively on the chest in an attempt to get a better shot at it. The problem was that I locked my craw in with the chest, ruining a challenge, but more importantly, killing all my characters by playing so aggressively. But I kept trying. On attempt 6, I was finally able to make things go perfectly. My positioning left all my characters alive and I was somehow able to kill the chest before turn 2. So that meant it did not get an insane attack off on my team. I just had to kill the other 3 mobs now and then I messed up. I got the run and my stupid mistake left me next to the enemy, ruining what I was so eager after. A perfect result. A result that proves after literal years of playing this game, I am somewhat competent at finishing some low level dungeon with an extra challenge. So after all that, I naturally could not give up. Or was it just luck? In my head, I wasn't sure anymore. I mean, for you that was pretty quick, but it took me quite a while and always having to wait and stuff that made me kind of anxious. I didn't have time in this challenge to keep trying over and over at this fight or throwing away already won battles just for one achievement. But <laughs> my stubbornness got the best of me yet again. No, this time the fight was flawless. Six turns, seven minutes, and three of my characters still full HP. Just an hour ago, I could not make anything happen against this mimic son of a bitch. But succeeding and not giving up just gave me so much confidence and motivation to crush this challenge. On top of this, I already reached level 60, which I'm so relieved by because soon after I would have been out of ways for easy XP. But now, Time to wrap this up. I get through Blur Cats with both extra challenges completed. The Shrek-like figures really stood no chance. Then the ever so easy Larva Dungeon. I managed to once again complete this with both extra challenges and the idol score. I'm on a roll. Now I just need money and the new special items. But here is where another specific part of the game comes in. Building sets. Needless to say, by level 60 there's a bunch of gear in the game for you to choose from and the right combination of hat, boots, cape, rings and amulets and whatever else there is can make a huge difference. So to challenge myself, I'm designing the sets. You know, for fun, since I do have a decent amount of early game knowledge, I'd say. Little did I know by this point though that soon after my head would be pulled out of the clouds and ran right into the ground. For now though, I did my best efforts to create a set for all my characters. The Kra should stay full damage and got a lot of agility gear because those spells were most suited for my needs. My Osa will stay a healer. There's a healing stat, but also intelligence increases healing. So I combine both to the highest amount possible. To make use of the Hopper Mage's unique elemental combinations with the runes and stuff, 
I'm still running strength and intelligence on her. You see, using an earth followed by a fire spell on a target actually deals a percentage bonus damage. Lastly, my panda, the positioner and supporter, gets a lot of damage too. Because, of course, changing the positions of mobs doesn't really take any stats. It's just what his spells do. So other than that, I go for a lot of chance, increasing my water damage. With this out of the way, it was time for me to make more money and get the sets. Therefore, I kept putting a ton of my high value resources in the market to sell every day and carefully chose more gear to craft and crush. And that went pretty well. I amassed enough to buy my new gear. I just needed to wait for everything to sell. Just kidding. I wanted to do the Avengers Endgame thing. It's actually just three days later. And so it was time to painstakingly gather all resources and items, craft everything up that I planned out and finish this detour equipping all my new gear. From the start of this challenge, we've really come a long way already. And I'm really proud I've been pulling through on this video idea because playing on four accounts gets insanely obnoxious. I'm obviously ecstatic. I mean, look, I have mounts now. I'm so ecstatic, in fact, that I wanted to call up a friend and known Dofus expert with thousands of hours. Defy. My objective is gonna be reaching one billion commas. So it's worth 80 million uh, commas worth of resources. In total, we got 10 million commas worth of runes. Very profitable day. Here's all the gear that I have for myself. We did it. We are first place rogue. Number one on the ladder inter-server Coliseum. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna be making fun of Bemis's <laughs> gear. This is my crawl, which is agility. How much agility does your cape give? And if it's not 99 or 100, you're in trouble. I'm gonna shoot. You should actually put a little bit of effort into mating. Like, just take one of <laughs> your hours and, ju and just put it into mating. You're missing 55 agility and four air damage from your set. I feel like <laughs> I'm showing off my dish to Gordon Ramsay in MasterChef right now. <laughs> <laughs> but the set ensemble itself is, is fine. I, I would give it an eight, because I actually quite like the composition of the set itself. You just lose marks on your mages, which are shit. But otherwise, like, the set is fine. This is my panda! Okay. Yeah, not bad. I was considering, like, maybe if you got an MP thing instead, because panda mobility is pretty important. This one has a 50... Okay, okay, okay. Going Bonus. crazy. Up enough. Hey, at least this one's perfect. Panda stuff looks fine. Show me how much chance he has. 350, okay. Okay, but not bad on the set twitch. Panda's okay, like, there's nothing I would really change. I approve of that, you get an 8.5. This looks okay. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if there'd be a better shield option. Range yeah. resistance? Oh, heals! Oh! Heals. Yeah, honestly, so for your OSA, it kind of looks good. What I would do is probably just switch the shield. The problem that I have is, given that your team is playing ranged, I don't understand why you need a healer. So I would probably opt more into int and damage instead of heals. Uh, but you do you. However, I don't approve of the idea behind the set, so I'd give you... Uh, 6.5 out of 10. So, okay. You know what? You bumped it up to a 7. There you go. You get the 7. Fuck yeah! Wait! What the hell is your gear? <laughs> okay, yeah, no. This is not gonna work. Bamis, uh, I understand what you're going for, but the way that you're splitting it here, it just doesn't make sense. Like, it wouldn't be worth it. It would be much more worth it to just not have any strength and your strength spell do less damage. Straight up, this level 36 set is better than what you have. The choice that you've made with splitting your items like that Reminds me of when my uh, seven-year-old brother tried playing the game and he uh, he put together like the peewee items that he dropped oh. and he was super proud and I was like, all right, buddy. <laughs> so you're comparing me to your seven-year-old brother? Uh, worse, because you are you actually have experience and you should know not to do this. <laughs> yeah, like your hover mage so far, F tier, bro. What's below F tier? I understand what you're trying to do with the elemental combination, 15%, so I... Like, I understand the idea of why you would do this, so I'm not gonna like completely shit on you, but I'll still give you like a 4, because you could have easily done much better. So th this one's probably like 3.5, 4, definitely a failing grade. Alright, Bambi, I'm gonna head out. Great, um, bye. I was obviously sad. There's no other way to say it. I got 27.5 out of 40 points, even though I really tried.
And I can't even be mad at him because he brought up some really good criticism, which also makes it obvious what I have to do. Level 80 will be the next gear upgrade point. I'm going to use all his advice to make the best gear I can and absolutely crush it. I mean, figuratively, I don't want to crush my, my gear that I make. That doesn't make sense. Wait, all this was to go to an island. Got a little carried away there, not gonna lie. But now it's time to finally set foot on Wabbit Island. Feels good to be here. Sadly, it'll get a little annoying considering this place is literally a labyrinth with tons of interconnected tunnels. My goal here is to once again achieve 100% quest completion, leading me to complete both dungeons, including a level 80 dungeon and receiving the sacred Kawat Dofus. Make no mistake, this isn't one of the six legendary eggs, but it gives 60 wisdom. And each point of wisdom increases your XP gain by 1%. So obviously this item is insanely important for this challenge. On the first day here, I spend my time killing a lot of adorable wabbits for a quest. The fights aren't super hard, so it's just a time thing. Then I essentially begin the storyline for the Kawat Dofus. And that mainly includes walking. A lot of walking. Let me show you what I mean. Take the quest I'm on right now. Houston, we have a problem. I'll leave that name uncommented. We need to uncover the cause of some spooky skeleton wabbits on Gravestone Island. How do you get to Gravestone Island, you ask? It's quite simple. You head up past the giant coward, enter a tunnel to the northern part of the island, run down to the west side to reach another tunnel that leads you to below Gravestone Island, and up on the surface, Herr Palpitane is waiting for you, which is clearly a wholly original character. I sense anger smoldering in you. You're frustrated with your weaknesses and wish that people would admire you and fear you. Embrace the dark side and everything will become easier. People will worship at your fate. Your enemies will tremble when they hear your name and your wholeness a power beyond comprehension. Okay, that's interesting and all, but what the fuck is up with these reanimated skeletons? And no, even though a main character from this questline believes that these rabbits are simply cursed, this is not actually a Pirates of the Caribbean reference, because that one only comes later in the game. So, Mr. Palpatine tells us this has to do with some princess fallen from grace, but that his rates are too high for him to give us more info. Because of course! Then we have to go all the way back again. Then we talk to this fox, then to this fox, and to this normal woman, surprisingly, who tells us about a rabbit to search for in the underground passages. Whoop-de-doo, we walk back. This time, we have to go through a room with an invisible floor that you can fall off of even when you Google the solution. Because why not? This guy tells us these fallen princes wanted to vote their imposter father of the ship. But he imprisoned them. Their dad, the king, by the way, also the keeper of the coward Dofus. So the princess naturally got mad and decided to learn to raise an army to kill their dad. Hey, that rhymed. Oh, and also they can be found on Gravestone Island. Ah! We walk back and tell Fox Lady what we found out and the quest ends. Phew. So that's one of 19 quests done. And no, this is not the most running I had to do out of any quests. It gets worse. There's a bunch more random stuff to do. A lot of quests just asking you to kill a certain amount of a certain mob. So probably the next interesting quest is the one where you finally confront these fallen princes and call them out on their bullshit. Turns out they're using this book called the Necrono Bacon, by the way. Get undressed and wait your turn. Keep your pants on though, you filthy becko. Never mind. I no longer know how to defend this game. The fight against these guys sucks as much as my limited interaction with them. I actually died once, which meant I had to walk all the way back, but then I managed just fine. Then I get sidetracked to Asia of all places to do some more main quests. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about it. You're not getting more context. Because after that, I make it all the way back through the horrid labyrinth to get to the Wa Wabbit's castle, which is just a level 60 dungeon. So not a giant deal. There isn't much to say about the boss fight either, since the challenges are pretty much impossible at this stage of the game. The only interesting detail is that we fought the imposter king, father of the bacon boys themselves. So naturally, I expect to get the coward doves after beating him. Come and fight me in my wawen, and we'll see which of us is truly the warrior warrior. 
Jesus fucking Christ. So yeah, plot twist, he goes home and wants a rematch, which is actually a level 80 dungeon. Let's see how that goes, shall we? The first few rooms were anything but no-brainers, but I did manage to make it to the final room. An achievement that made me happy by itself, being way below level 80 and all. But the last and hardest thing that is now between me and getting the cow at Dofus, this guy in his stupid robot. Either way, I was gonna leave this dungeon. The question was just, was it gonna be empty handed or with the Cavett Dofus? That was unexpected. With all my characters having so many more options, I was really able to beat a level 80 dungeon. Granted, it's probably one of the easier ones, but this is clearly still my biggest achievement. In the hype of having two fake Dofus eggs, I wanted to finish Coward Island ASAP. Okay, it's actually two quests left that are literally just me fighting more rabbits. So with the power of editing, we're done. Hey, we haven't switched chapters in a while. Super yacht. Super yacht. I am going to spend the next 50 hours alone in solitary confinement. Finally, some peace and quiet. The city is a nightmare. Capitalism has taken over. People don't care about each other anymore. Loneliness is the fastest spreading epidemic. I just can't. I'm going to spend the next 50 hours buried alive in this coffin. Now it's time for chapter for Vanta. On day 42, we continue the main quest line to discover the six legendary primordial Dofus. We want to venture into the evil forest, whose lord might be in possession of one. This won't be easy though, so my characters have to visit their class temples in preparation. I pray before my god statue to receive a blessing of the 12. With a bit of luck, this blessing will protect you from the wrath of the master of the evil forest. If not, the gods will lose a disciple. But they'll get over it. You must lose a fly to catch a trout. Okay, I'm no longer sure I should be doing this. Some guy gives us his notes about the forest in an effort to help us out in trying not to die. We make our way over to the nearby edge of the evil forest, which itself, just by the way, is fittingly illustrated on the map with a giant skull. The character Lansuft stops us from entering. We insist on entering. In true Dofus fashion, he immediately does a 180 and wants to help us with our quote, intent on dying. He makes us a pendulum that reduces the effects of the crazy making magic going on inside. With blessing and pendulum equipped, I stroll through the forest mostly unbothered until I find it. Dark Vlad's clearing. That's right, the Dark Lord of the Evil Forest is none other than the fire-haired boy himself. To other adventurers, known simply as Dark Vlad. We ask him which Dofus he took, but the only reward for our courage should be the right to die in battle against his servants. I manage to fight them off. L. I order him now to tell me which Dofus he took. He wants to recruit me into his undead skeleton army. He casts a weird curse and I hide to gain time. I face the Kaffirs in battle, once again surviving. You've managed to exhaust my patience. 
die. Are you still here? What is this wizardry? I tell him the gods are protecting me. And I repeat my question once again. I am the master of Razerian Stophus. Know that no one shall ever take it from me. Now leave before I decide to bury you alive just for the fun of it. I try to find out more about Rosarion, whoever that is. Could just be made up. I told you to scarp her. I insist, but the next time I know what's going on, I am suddenly stood outside the forest again. I return to a character I spoke to before, who tells me about how the Lenolds, these foxes, used to guard Adophus on Wabbit Island. But after they got exiled by the Wawabid, they stored it in a different place. A place where it was apparently not safe from Dark Vlad. He says Razarion's pupils, who seems to be real, once reflected emerald. This must mean Dark Vlad is now the keeper of the Emerald Dofus. We learn about a powerful sorceress in the swamps that can help us locate the Primordial Dofus. Finally, we get there, but she said she already knew we would arrive here soon. That we could be the chosen one, the one to reunite the six Dofus. And the quest ends here. For now. But I mean, this chapter is clearly called Bonta, so what the hell was that about, right? Talk about an exposition dump. Bonta is one of the two big cities on the continent and Kama. These two cities, Bonta and Brock, Angels and Devils, are at an ever long war. As a player, you get the choice to join either one and try to rise up the ranks, helping them destroy the counterpart. But this video has goals, so honestly I do not care at all about this war. But you can do up to 100 alignment quests to reach a maximum of alignment at level 100. These quests are super good for XP, so because the next milestone I really want to reach is level 80, I join the ranks. I mean, Bonta, that is. That's like, you know, the chapter name again. Level 80 is a great point to get a better set, and I really need that. I cannot keep running around like such an idiot. Since you can actually get your alignment quite early in the game, a lot of the quests starting out becoming a Bontarian are super easy for where I'm at. So we usually go to this guy, he gives us a new quest, Oh, go there, do this, we do it, we come back to him, and we start the next one. It's not until the alignment level 4 quest that it gets annoying. We need to extract skeleton teeth by killing skeletons, but we need exactly 32, enough to make a pair of human dentures, which is exactly why I didn't ask what they're for. Anyway, you can actually gain as many of these teeth as you want, but you can only progress the quest when you have exactly 32. So if I end up with 33, I need to do it again. Obviously, that being said, dropping 32 of these with four characters takes a while, but we get there in the end. Then things go more smoothly again. Some super easy fights, some running around, finding clues that I definitely didn't just Google, and we make it to the alignment quest number 10. That'll already be a tenth of the progress. Awesome. Quick side note, you actually need to reach the maximum level Level 200 to finish these quests, they get notoriously hard, so that's not the goal. Speaking of hard, quest 10 has us find an aggressive boar in the Kanya fields, just south of the city Bonta. It's quite the large area and the boar can only spawn on one map at a time. And if someone kills it, it takes a few hours to respawn anywhere in the area. I had no choice but to aimlessly wander around, seeing as this itself can take multiple days. I mean, look at this footage, it's just me running around for 20 minutes. But then, surprisingly... Oh, yes! Let's fucking go! I think you're able to tell, I don't particularly enjoy these types of quests. I got really lucky here. The fight itself doesn't present as much of a challenge, and we can finish another quest. This is the point where it gets a little spicier. For the next ones, we need to beat the Boar Cat and the Smith's Dungeon again. But since I've of course already beaten those before, it's quite a breeze.
I've made it all the way to quest 17 already. Not bad, honestly. I'm psyched for the next and I've got to kill more Kaffers. But this time, one specific type. This quest actually sucks because the elite Kaffers, the one needed for this quest, are very popular to kill since their drops are valuable. So there's no mobs with a lot of them. After a while, I finish this quest too though. Fast forwarding a bit, we get to quest number 20. It's another special one and we'll actually get a cool reward for it. The problem is that we need to visit a ghost. To find him, we need to become a ghost ourselves. That introduces a new fun mechanic to you guys, the energy system. You have a bunch of it and when you die, you lose some. You can use food and consumables to restore your energy though, because it only restores very slowly by itself. Like, it literally takes days. Anyway, when you are out of energy, you turn into a ghost. So, since I've obviously never died before, <laughs> I had to kill myself over and over for this quest. Good enough, we turn into a ghost and settle the business with the dude. With our energy now being critically low after being revived for the foreseeable future. Geez, I sure hope that won't have any consequences. We get to alignment 20, another cool milestone, and now we get to choose an order to join inside the Bontarian military. Honestly, I don't actually know what that really does. It just gives you a cool title and more XP from another achievement. Also, you get to talk to the King of Bonta, that's kinda cool. So, we're now a disciple of Silvos. Yay! Anyway, now we're on to do the Crackler dungeon. This one, despite being aimed at level 70, is actually quite hard. Like, harder than the whole of Wabbit Island. And the fact that we'll turn into a ghost again if we die just once, does not help in dealing with that thought. The deal with these Cracklers, which are just stone monsters, is that they straight up deal a lot of damage. Plus, keeping them at range is super hard, and face tanking them is pretty hard to survive. On top of all that, they steal your movement and action points with their attacks. That's as annoying as it sounds. Even so, I was going to go into this battle at least trying the challenges. Killing the legendary crackler first and not ending your turns next to enemies. The mobs do start on the other side of the map, which is a good sign. The problem? Wanting to kill the boss first meant targeting him for obvious reasons, but the fight is actually set up in a way where he takes his turn last. So this way, he's always behind his minions. He also barely moves and instead summons even more mobs. After turn one, already a big problem on our hands. And then he casts a spell that heals every turn. Great. This is where I realized my very survival of this dungeon is now no longer guaranteed because I was fooled by the level 70 recommendation as well. Now though, I started going all in on focusing down the smaller mobs. I gave up on the challenge and slowly I was able to progress through the fight. At the same time though, the dungeon boss kept creeping closer with his two movement points. I could still finish the fight without finishing my turn next to an enemy, but then the boss summoned another mob and they were all right in my face. This wasn't very good. I tried to keep them all off me as well as I could, but I was getting cornered and yet I was somehow still holding on. I always managed to push them back one way or another and my Osa was keeping everyone alive. My strategy, my whole plans with this team were working. Yeah, okay, I didn't expect that to happen. He removed all my action points while I was cornered, which basically meant I lost a full turn with all my characters. And suddenly their HP wasn't looking very good anymore. He summoned another mob and my Osa died. I didn't give up though. And then somehow, that was horrifying. If dungeons are ramping up this much in difficulty, I might get into a problem. My gear doesn't seem to be holding up now that we're getting to harder dungeons. And I'm just glad that I didn't turn into a ghost because some guy kept throwing rocks at me. Anyway, I'm getting close to level 80, so let's finish this. Okay, never mind. Apparently this stupid goblin quest is my limit that I can't progress past. And it's just because it's a forced solo fight again as well, meaning I cannot bring my whole team. The fight itself is honestly absurd. You protect some living tree from way too many mobs. 
So either you're dying or he's dying and either one fails the fight. Apparently the recommended level is 75. So once again, seems like my gear just sucks. I hate this. So we're just stuck at alignment 24 now. Instead, I moved on to a different and actually pretty special dungeon. I'm talking about the blob dungeon. So by special, I just meant it's got a weird gimmick for no reason. You see, the first four rooms are as always, but after that, you get to choose one of four boss rooms. Like many times in this game, this boils down to four slightly altered dungeon bosses that each have different resistances in specific elements. You know, red for fire, blue for water, and so on. This also means though, to complete the dungeon fully and gain any achievements, you need to defeat the dungeon four times, completing the same challenges on each run. This dungeon, surprisingly enough, is actually pretty easy. So I'd rather just leave this day of monotonous fights out of the video. Oh, huh. I kind of wasn't expecting that. I mean, hey, we've reached level 80. Leveling has been so surprisingly easy. I've always been able to do another quest line or another area or another dungeon to help me get XP. I'm surprised how many fun objectives there are in the game that actually help you level. I felt like oftentimes you're just stuck grinding mobs, but things are kind of working out. I mean, I guess it is helping that I have four characters. So now that I was level 80, it was time to go back to the drawing board. I seriously want to make a good set myself. I cannot understate that. It's easy to Google and copy one, and I've always done this, but it's always bugged me and I know it is hard, but I've got to be able to learn it somehow. And since I still so vividly dream about DeFi's feedback, I was gonna fix everything I did wrong. I gave my panda wow more movement points, so he has more options to position others. I optimized my hopper by switching to just be strength because the set compositions I can use that way will let her deal way more damage. I even make sure the HP is rounded to a nice number because that was somehow a critique. I wanted to invest more money to get the right items and for the first time, I wanted to mage them so everything gives more stats. It wasn't that long before I had finalized my sets. I realized how much I already learned. The criticism was harsh, of course, but once I got it past my ego, I seriously profited from it. I guess maybe I do know how to make sets now. I mean, I heard the advice before to surround yourself with smart people, people that know more than you, albeit it was usually applied to more useful skills than making sets in a video game that no one plays anymore. But that's besides the point. I'm gonna take this set to defy again and this time I'm setting the noble goal of improving my total score to at least 30 out of 40. But um, aren't I forgetting something? Oh right, I gotta actually craft the sets and as I said before, maging is anything but cheap. Especially when it's gear for four characters. How am I gonna pay for all that? <laughs> <laughs> you fools. You really think it took me that long to simply get to level 80? You simpletons this entire time I was selling all the resources. I was doing daily tasks that give me money. I was crushing items a lot. What I'm trying to say is I have 8 million camas now. Obviously, I will use up a lot of it, but I am prepared and your mind is surely blown because I never gave you a perspective for how much money that actually is, but it is a lot for, you know, like level 80 guys. I think it's a pretty good thing um, and you're just gonna have to take my word for it. I am prepared to make the last 20 levels of this challenge as smooth sailing as smooth, sm smooth sailing as possible. No more struggling on dungeons my level, no more bad reviews or questionable team setups. I'm going to use my game knowledge and win this goddamn challenge. I've played over 50 days just for this video. Hell, by this point, that means I've surely sunk in 100 hours already. I'm not doing that to just half acid. Where was I? Oh yeah, this is what maging looks like, by the way. It's not so easy to explain, but I'm not sure if we should get into it. Hi, Professor Bob Amis here. I want to explain the Dofus maging mechanic to you. Smith Magus, like the one that Bamus is paying for his work, uses the aforementioned runes to improve the stats of items. When you apply one, it either has a chance of failing completely, it has the chance of improving one stat and then losing another, or to crit and gain a stat without losing any others. 
This is obviously not unlike gambling in a way and takes a lot of money. This brings me to the next point of exomaging, which dude, they don't care about that. <sighs> Sorry about that guys. I think you get the gist now. In the meantime, I've managed to finish all the items. In some special cases, depending on the item and my luck, the stats can get insane. This cloak right here usually gives up to 25 HP, but after this mage, it gives 171. That's over 100 extra HP right there. Needless to say, I'm heading into a call with Defy right now with a healthy dose of enthusiasm. How friendly do you want me to be? I mean, I would say same as last time, but it's been almost half a year. <laughs> No. I'll just tell you what, like, just looking at this crap, I'm already gonna say you seem to be doing pretty nicely. Oh, look at that. Look at that beautiful HP. One thing I don't like is the empty trophy slots. I would give you, for the crap, I would just say eight. I like the set. It's a decent structure. Okay. I probably would have done something slightly different than Royal Bluff times three. I would have done times two and then been able to use trophies. Here's the X problem, child. Uh, so, set, set seems fine. I mean, there's not too much to criticize. One thing I don't like is when you use transcendence runes on items that don't have perfect stats. I, I love how you are completely that serious about the 78 out of 80 strength that that's not perfect. Bro, I will shoot you. Last time you gave me 4 out of 10 for this one. I feel it's a bit worse than Kra. I definitely think you could have made more choices that would help you get more damage. I, I don't know. I'm going to give you only slightly less than Kra. I'll give you a 7.3. Um, wait, yeah. wait. 7.34. The Osa going all in on the healing, which I must say the healing is very good. Awesome. I like that. I do see that you have a shield that I know gives heals, so respect yes. that. Yes. Right, so your, your set in total could have had 8, 8, and 4, which is 20, and the ring 7, so it could have had 27 more heals just yeah. by making better decisions. I'm going to give you slightly more than Hupper Mage, but still less than Kra. Hupper Mage, I said 7.34, so I'll give you 7.36 on this one. I'm just saying right away, you would better have 6 fucking MP. Oh, sh bro. He does have 12 AP. Look at that. Look at that instead. That does. I don't care. It's a movement character. It should have 6 MP. Uh. Hover, hover assault and battery. So, not only does it give chance, it gives MP, which I think is more important than the cape, which gives AP and no chance. I think, I think MP would have been more important than 1 AP. So, I think that you probably... Now, my personal opinion is you should have prioritized MP, but aside from that, Okay, actually, to help me make the decision on this, I want to see if there was a better amulet choice. What I would have said is if you actually cared that much about the one range, then you buy a Twitcher and you buy a better amulet. Uh... Uh, so I actually like this one the least, so I will give you a 6.9. I wanted to reach 30, yet you have given me 29.6 points. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was on purpose. I am... I seriously had not expected this. I felt like I improved so much, but also made some small mistakes that I shouldn't have. Sure, he was probably more strict, but at the same time, because I made my gear, he now raided those as well, which just gave him more to criticize. I didn't make the 30 points, which I held for impossible. But at the end of the day, he once again had reasons not to give me perfect scores. And I was left wondering if I'm just too much of an idiot to make some decent sets. The learning curve is high, but why am I not seeing these things? Thinking of gathering a ton of commas again to maybe get a chance to build a set at level 100 seemed so stupid and the thought alone frustrated me. The only saving grace was that I now had way stronger sets to take on the next chapter.
Unlike the name implies, this chapter in fact has neither to do with going to the moon, nor with cryptocurrencies. We're going to visit Moon Island, recommended for levels 80 to 100. As I'm fulfilling the quest to get there, let me get you some facts. The island is banana shaped and is a pretty tropical place. There's a tribe living there, turtles on the beach, dead pirates and whatever those monsters are supposed to be. There's three dungeons which you all need to beat for the questline. Yeah, there's another questline on this island and once you finish it, you get the Dococo. Yes, another fake Dofus, this time one that heals you every three turns, so it's actually pretty good. And of course, it'll help us with getting so much closer to level 100. Starting off, I destroyed some living palm trees. Call me Ken because I am good at beach. No, seriously, this may be the easiest area around here, but getting the damage in with my new sets made me feel less bad about them. And that's nice. I am insanely strong. In fact, I immediately headed to the cannibal village, the first dungeon. And boy, it's not even worth mentioning because I destroyed it completely. Even fulfilling the special challenges is getting increasingly easy for me. Makes me feel smart. If you don't know why I'm so ecstatic, just look at this flood of achievements. Also, I seriously have zero idea what to do with this place is, though I'm concerned with them being called cannibals. I did some more preparation to fulfill the different side quests in a quicker fashion and straight up already went to dungeon 2 of 3. Much smaller island than Wabbit Island, in case you didn't realize. Since I enjoyed day 60 so much, I redid the same stuff again on day 61. Just kidding. There was an issue with the game servers and they had to do a rollback. Isn't that funny? I make it to the big baddie Lechuk and I breeze right through. Okay, well, my panda died, but as the gods say, you must lose a fly to catch a trout. Oh, did I mention this was a level 90 dungeon? Yeah, I can do that now. Day 63 was a lot of Aaron type quests. Smaller side quests, running around, talking to people, farming some mobs. Doing this led me all the way to finishing Moon Island. Well, almost. I still need to do Moon Dungeon, which is level 100. So I decided to wait on that because that's against the system. Sounds weird, but hear me out. Doing dungeons in a certain order gives more rewards since there's a long quest line guiding you through almost all the dungeons in the game. So filling out the missing dungeons first will give us a lot more XP by the time we return to Moon Island because then we'll also do the quest. Are you still following? Good, because you have to do a lot of thinking in this video, I know. But don't worry, I trust you, because if you were too TikTok brained, you wouldn't be here after like however long this video is already going. As you've already guessed, that means more dungeons. But first, for some revenge. This time, I annihilated the goblins and I realized the commas invested in gear is worth it just for the site alone. Right, so now I'm doing the jelly dungeon. This is similar to the blood dungeon in the way that there's four differently colored bosses. This time they're just cube shaped. But you fight them all at the same time, which isn't an issue for me, of course. In fact, not only did I finish this fight with idols for a separate achievement, but I also kept finishing my turns directly next to a teammate. And I made sure once one of my characters attacks an enemy, only he deals damage to them. Those challenges are really a mouthful and that I didn't mess any of it up amazes me still. Then I went back to Odomai Island. You guys remember, right? Cannonballs and all that. Now we're doing another dungeon here. Not to kingship anyone, but don't ask me why there's skeleton enemies everywhere in this game. Wait, I just realized this dungeon is actually called Odomai's Ark. This is a Noah's Ark reference, right? It's Jesus Cannon in Dofus? Anyway, Gurlo the Terrible is one of the first times dungeon bosses have complicated mechanics that you need to read up on before the fight. He spawns these barrels and you need to somehow ensure he ends his turns next to them because only then he can even take damage. As you can see, this is a giant pain in the ass. In fact, I sadly couldn't complete any additional challenges, which means less money and less XP. But I'd rather save the time and actually finish the dungeon. No. Wait, what's that? It's, huh? Oh, oh right. Oh, yeah, okay. It, yeah, it's a, it's a music thing again.
yeah, that's right. I'm back to War Warbot. And that's yet again because of this dungeon quest line. Because the first time I beat it didn't count because I wasn't at this quest yet. But the reason I'm even showing you this is because I wanted you guys to see the difference of a few levels and some items. I know I've been praising myself, uh, Defy hasn't, but this is what really makes hard earned progress in this game so satisfying. The first four rooms took me 19 turns of all my four characters the first time around, which took 22 minutes. The first four rooms the second time around, however, only took 11 turns and a measly 13 minutes. That is almost half and having to sit through all that yourself, you really notice the huge difference. So revisiting this place was actually quite nice. At this point, I had already reached level 90. It got increasingly clear that if I stay on a decent enough pace, I will be able to reach level 100. Really gotta let that sink in. I had 62 of the required 95 million XP. Looking at the dungeon quest, there was only one left before getting to the point where they would ask me to challenge Moon. So I went to the Puppet Master in Dramax Theater. You can see by using your eyes that I am not immediately skipping to the boss fight. That's because I noticed these fights alone are unreasonably long and hard. Just like my c This meant it was really challenging. Cat! I was gonna say cat! Why'd you cut away? Long and hard, just like my cat. It's ridiculous. Here, you can go now, Lilo. Also, my penis. At this point, it had not yet sunk in that this was gonna be the hardest dungeon I'm taking on in this entire challenge. Remember comparing my fight times to doing Wow Wobot? The first four rooms of Dramax Theater took me 15 minutes and 10 turns. Just fucking kidding. That was the fourth room alone. And if you thought that was all, entering the final boss room triggers a cutscene. A cutscene in, in Dofus. If you've ever played this game, you know you're in trouble. Oh god. Oh god, why, why do I hear boss music? This right here, this slither of HP, is why this fight sucks. Yeah. You see, this fight consists only of the boss, the Puppet Master, but he's invincible. The only way you can deal damage to him is by killing all five of the puppets he spawns, which in itself is sadly not quite so easy. What's more, if you don't kill them fast enough, he respawns them all. So had that fucker not survived with a few HP, the boss would have been vulnerable and not be respawning them all. So seems like I got quite close, right? Wrong. Again. You suck. Because this dude has 6,000 HP. That is more than anything we've battled so far. Even my overgeared characters have like 1,700 HP. That's a quarter. Still seems doable? Well, he's only vulnerable for two turns. Yeah, two. In no world is that enough for us to deal 6,000 damage. So after that, he spawns the goddamn puppets again. The thing all I want to do is finish Moon Island. With some money I accumulated, I also tried to upgrade my gear with some pretty strong rings that are expensive as hell. What I didn't realize is, instead of buying the same ring three times, I actually bought one ring that is super weak for the two million I spent on it. I screwed up and now I wasted so much money. Really not the best day for me. Ah well. You know what they say, maybe tomorrow will be better. Today is not better. Time to try Dramax Theater again.
Okay, possible or not, this dungeon is really draining time since the fights are not the fastest. Well, good news is I did make him vulnerable once on try 3, but since I focused so hard on damage, my Craw, the main damage dealer, died immediately. This way, I could not keep the damage output up at all. So, realizing this, for the first time on a dungeon, I was left no choice but to throw in the towel. My stubbornness only got me so far. I'm seriously no pro, and this dungeon is incredibly tough. Not to mention, we're not even level 100 yet. It was a weird feeling, thinking, what comes next? What do I do now? So... Screw that crap, we're going back in, baby. You really thought I'm giving up? Please, I've got days to spare. This man just made it personal. And he's a theater? I hate people who do that. So close! Phase 2 with all 4 characters, they just need to survive! Ah, go again! Fuck! <sighs> okay, I've made progress. The question is, can I make even more progress by applying learnings alone? Without a higher level or better gear? I admit, I've been throwing a rage-induced fit and taking a step back, calming down and giving it one shot and really trying to make it count. It's been hours and I'm sick of this. So are you, I'm sure. So, hey, one fully strategic attempt, then I'll move on. I swear. I'm putting a lot of effort into the order I kill the summons now. They all do different things based on their colors and some are clearly stronger than others. My characters are quite spread out, but that's actually fine. I preserve HP by life stealing off of my own summons, which is a plus. Obviously my Osa can also heal, but he does need to help with the damage output as well. I hit the perfect balance. Phase 1 passed, no biggie, time for the real fight. Still relatively healthy, but I cannot lose any single character. Again, focus really is the key here. They deal good damage, but if they spread it out across all my characters, they'll survive. One puppet goes down. The positioning is working out in a way where I can actually hit the right puppets. There's two left. I have this turn to kill them before he respawns them all. That's where I'd be screwed. And now it comes down to my hopper, my last character to kill the final one. I am happy. Now I feel truly unstoppable. Not giving up on these kinds of challenges and actually trying over and over is so fun. Except maybe for the part where I screamed like a child. I realize now optimizing everything or letting other high level people lead you through hard fights is one of the main fun killers. Of course, it's down to taste, but paling is good because it makes winning so much better. Even though when we're getting impatient, we can forget that. Anyway, on to moon now. Oops, 
That's a fluke. Well, it happens. Okay, I'm not even in room 5. Perhaps I should make sure I still take other fights serious. This dungeon also has tricky mechanics, is what I would say, but I forgot to record the final room! What can I say? Did all this leading up to this dungeon? Don't even have the footage. I first tried it. So, um, yeah. Maybe that's good after that whole drama drama. What was I doing again? Right, <laughs> I finished Moon Island. I knew there was a goal somewhere here. Look at this pretty though, Coco. How nice! Well, it's day 73 now, and I'm level 93. So, I've got 27 days for the longest 7 levels of this challenge. Yeah, um, somehow even the name of this chapter alone makes it sound a little unfun, don't you think? But like in any good movie, we know how it goes. A tight finish against the clock. And this will be no different. Without further ado, here we go. Oh shit! It's done! It's over! That was so quick! My characters really are level 100! Man, it's day 76 and in real life time from the start of this challenge to here really was a long time coming. I'm really proud and it has been really fun. But um, now the challenge isn't over. I mean, it is because I reached the goal. This all feels terribly anticlimactic because it's, you know, day 76. Well, new goal, I guess. Find a new goal. So I started running around finding random tasks to do. But wait, what's this? Tirana the Terrible. Oh yeah, she's a bounty mob. Bounty mobs are rare mobs like the aggressive boar from the alignment quest. Finding them is quite special and you can get pretty good rewards for beating them and bringing them back to jail for their numerous war crimes. If I do it with 4 characters at a time, Tirana can get me something like a million Kamas with just one fight. That's like a thousand big cannonballs. No wait. That's like a hundred big cannonballs. The first time she actually destroyed me, but after looking up how her spells work and finding a strategy, the fight was super fun to figure out. Don't forget kids. Tax evasion is never an answer. And now that I'm thinking, you know what? If I can get a lot more Kamas, I could make a level 100 set. A good one. A great one even. Yeah, I need a ton of money, but with the time left, this could work. Then, Defy would have no choice but to give me great scores. I mean, there's only so much I can do wrong, right? I've gotten a ton of feedback from him. Maybe this should be my final goal. So? it was time to get theory crafting. I wanted to make one big change. Swap my craw to the fire element. 
This is because at level 90, she gained a super strong fire AoE spell that I absolutely love. I wanted to make sure I don't miss any option for my sets this time. I looked at my lists of stats, prioritized which ones are most important, which, well, was mainly damage because it's PvE, and then compared different set compositions, like tons of them, to see how much damage my spells would do after. My panda was supposed to stay more or less the same. One big addition should be though that he has the maximum of 6 movement points that are super important for positioners. I spared no cost for these sets. If the item benefits me, I put it on there and compared all the intricacies. For my hopper, I wanted to stay full strength and I kept on trying to ensure my spells deal the maximum amount of damage possible. I know I was racking up the costs quick, but how I'd get there would be a problem for future me. My trusty Osa, of course, would once again be focused on providing as much heals as possible for my team. While building the set, I tried to compare the costs, but I just couldn't find myself caring if it was more expensive. I had bigger ambitions. But the keen eye may notice that there's one more thing I wanted to include for the possibly perfect level 100 set. The Emerald Dofus. That's right, one of the actual six primordial Dofus eggs. The easiest one to attain with a level 100 equipping requirement. The Dofus that none other than Dark Vlad himself is in possession of. These Dofus questlines are brutal compared to anything we've done so far. And with the sets now finalized in theory, I had 19 days to make it happen. Yumi cut hair. One star. You melted my scissors. I had third degree burns all over my hands. The pain. The agony. Ah. Oh hell no. Fuck this. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. You leave, not today. Wait. What the hell is your gear? <laughs> what are you doing? I'm just saying right away, you better have six fucking MP. You should actually put a little bit of effort into maging. You just Stop. Put marks on your mages, which are shit. What I would have said is if you actually cared that much about the one range, then you buy a Twitcher and you buy- Now, will you just go? Woo-ah, 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 wah, boo-hoo-ah, I'm so sad. Let's be honest. I got myself way in over my head here. 19 days is a while, but I set myself a giant goal. So I'm prefacing now, it could be that I fail, but if so, I hope I fail while having a genuinely good time. So what do I even have to do? From the gear being finalized to actually acquiring it is a long process. Let me give you some oversight over this mess. One half towards the goal is genuinely bringing in the money to firstly craft the gear and then to mage it to ensure it of course gives us all that it can. The other and more gruesome list of tasks is the one for the Emerald Dofus. Again, there's only six primordial Dofus and they're a big deal, even with this one being the easiest to acquire. There are eight quests, all with a good chunk of effort in beating them, but all the bigger requirements I've outlined specifically. For one, I need to beat over 20 dungeons. Yeah, I mean that. Then I need to acquire Mount Tame, which you get from yet another level 100 dungeon, and then read a mount on all my characters. Yeah, those things I'm writing have reading mechanics, and the wiki for this is so long that I have never done this before, and it takes hella real life time. From there, remember me explaining bounties just then? They recently changed how to quest the Kanya Bandits works, so now you need a total of 15 bounties caught. This is insane because finding this many on the spot is super lengthy and frustrating as hell. Following that are four separate legendary treasure hunts. I won't go into detail now, but they are tough not to crack. I'll have to get help because the fights are literally impossible for me. For Draconthropy, for what a mouthful. For Draconthropy, I need to beat yet another level 100 dungeon. But I should be good on that one. It's no Dramax. Finally, to acquire the Emerald Dofus, you're tasked with completing a tough, special, puzzle-like boss fight. This sucks because, of course, I'll also have to complete it four times. Okay, any questions? Doesn't matter, because we've got literally no time to answer them. 
As discussed before, I need a lot of income for my sets. There's some things I'll be doing every day to get a good amount of camas, but obviously I won't mention these every time because it's the same daily tasks. The first thing is a daily repeatable quest called Almanacs, with differing rewards depending on the day. On a good one, I can make 80,000 camas in like 5 minutes, although that is rare. Then a hidden mini dungeon with 5 easy rooms. The boss then drops some very valuable alloys used for crafting high level items. And finally, I've obviously amassed tons of resources over this adventure and have not yet been able to sell them all. So constantly I put more stuff in the player market to sell while accomplishing tasks. Speaking of money, after completing set daily activities, I started on the first side task in preparation of quests. That will also bring in a ton of money, thankfully, bounties. They're super time consuming, as I said, but they give big cash rewards. To make this process quicker, even while destroying my brain in the process, I decided to go to a different area with each one of my characters. Specific bounty mobs spawn in specific areas. So if I'm running through four different areas at a time, I'm quadrupling my chances of finding one. Again, if you run through the entire area they spawn in, it's still very unlikely to find the bounty. Running around constantly switching between four characters was as painful as it looks to you guys right now, so I'll just show the highlights. Because this tactic works. After a while, I found the first bounty, with Baby. Making sure to never ask for the reason behind his name, I easily kill the level 50 bounty and get my counter to 2 out of 15. Later, I also find the very easy Bolet Master, 3 out of 15. It's also important to say that the bounty spawn rates are the same no matter the size of the area. What does that mean? Well, I'm first going to the smallest possible areas because that means my encounter chances per map are way better. In turn, that means though that the first bounties will be a lot easier to find in the smaller areas than the later ones in the bigger areas. And uh, the rest of the day, I didn't find any more bounties. After a long search, I found one bounty. Dumsh. That's literally all I have to show for day 83. Except for making some camas. Like, don't get me wrong, that's going great and all so far. Not really a big concern really, but the bounties alone? This one marks 4 out of 15. At this rate, I'm simply screwed. As a change of pace, I actually read through the wiki page to hopefully understand breeding Draco turkeys just a bit better. I'll save you the details, thank me later. I just want to give you an idea of the efforts. The easiest way I can afford to breed is to head to the local paddock in Bonta. There I have to buy two unnutrient Draco turkeys for each of my characters and get some breeding equipment. There's a few stats a Dragon Turkey has that can be modified over time with the breeding equipment. First, you need to make them become an adult. By force, I guess. Let's not question the ethics. And then you need to make them fertile. All the stats involved take hours, if not days, to alter, so I'm getting this started early. Since I was only barely able to grasp the theory up to that point though, I decided to just buy a test Dragon Turkey to see if I can make the stats move how they were supposed to. And then I found another bounty mob. Sadly, this one is super tough, so it took me way too long to actually recruit help. For an antisocial autist like myself, that's always a challenge, but I got there in the end. One third done, baby. I finally started to see the Kamas pour in from my efforts. The 8 million here look a lot, but there's two items I'll need for all four of my characters that will alone take all that money. So rest assured, I still need lots more. Right after, I finally figured out how the breeding process properly works. Due to the tiredness mechanic though, I also noticed how long it takes. You see, my breeding equipment actually increases the proper stats quite quick. But at the same time, tiredness also increases with it. When tiredness is maxed out, it's impossible for your dragon turkey to increase these stats any further. So when tiredness is full, you need to move it out of the paddock to rest and wait 24 hours. That's a lot of micromanagement and is exactly why I immediately went ahead with starting the breeding process on all my characters. While I'm not mentioning it, rest assured, during various times, I'm logging on or teleporting back to manage these crossed-eyed idiots. Anyways, I sought out more bounties, who's surprised, and found another one. That's not all though, shortly after that, I found one more. Just kidding, I found two. 
at the same time. Kidding again? Never trust me. I found three at the same time. I was stressed and rushing to get all of them before any of them got taken from me. I told you these are rare and obviously tons of people want them. So I got one, then rushed straight to the second, got that one too, but when I returned to the third just 10 minutes after, it was gone. <laughs> I found no other bounties after that and end of the day on 8 out of 15. As surprised as I was reading back my notes just now, I was able to breed the Dragon Turkeys on day 86 on all four characters. I know I explained how lengthy the process is, but keep in mind I'm a time managing pro. Also there was a bit of an IRL break in between recording the last two days, but you know... Uh, 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 uh. Man, look at this list of goals, we're making so much progress. All this just for a green egg. Now just try to guess what I did after this. Wrong! I went outside to touch some grass. Don't want to go crazy in here, but then I hunted for more bounties. And as unbelievable as it is, I found four bounties. It's absolute insanity. Well, I found five, but I couldn't beat the fifth for the life of me. So apparently I just decided to give up on that one. But that's 12 out of 15. This is by far the most time intensive task. So getting close to completion and ramping up the pace does leave me cautiously hopeful. On day 87, I did the Coolidge Cavern, the dungeon giving me the mount taming spell. I'll never use it, but now I have it as it's a quest prerequisite. Then I started on the grueling 20 dungeon run. You see, the reason it's 20 dungeons is because I need to soul 5 different dungeon bosses from levels 40 to 80. Souling is essentially just equipping an empty soul stone before a fight and before ending it, casting the soul capture spell. This then fills the soul stone with the mob you've just defeated. Makes sense? Don't worry about it. It only works once per fight though, meaning I need to run all 5 dungeons 4 times. Long story short, I revisited boost dash and powered through as fast as I could. But since this was a very easy dungeon, I actually soloed the fight with all 4 characters, meaning they can all soul the boss in one go. Here's where the funny soul capture spell comes in though, because for some reason I find it incredibly hard to remember to use it right before killing the last enemy. It's just something I don't have to think about 99% of the time. So then I forgot and had to run the dungeon again. The now pregnant dragon turkeys finally gave birth. Ew, sex. And guess what? After that, I actually found the last two bounties. I know, I said I'm on 12 out of 15, but the entire time I must have miscalculated and missed something because those two marked this task finally done. What a massive relief. All the souling is now officially done and another annoying mission is prepared for. I was also able to craft the first two sets and mage them. The damage my hopper and crowd do are amazing now and I absolutely love it. But we have one week left. This puts us at a point with a lot of unfinished tasks. Every day thinking about this challenge and even while playing it, I got really anxious about not succeeding in it. I got to be honest, I've been putting everything I have into making this video and I was so scared it would end on a bad note just because I was very greedy with my goals. This game and this video mattered to me a lot but again there's little time so with conflicting emotions I still moved on. Now I'm continuing with the actual quests and starting the Emerald Dofus questline officially. 
If you remember, we left off after our meeting with the fire-haired boy himself, where we then met with the powerful sorceress. She now brews us a potion that will apparently weaken Dark Vlad, as we want to go back to kill him and take the Dofus, as the name of the quest suggests. As it turns out though, Dark Vlad is gone, and in his place is Helmina, his companion. After defeating her, we find out he set out on a journey to, quote, hunt down his memories. Clueless as to what that means, we return to Mariana, who gives us the memory meter. Essentially, it points to where Dark Vlad went, which starts a wild goose chase across Amkana. This leads us to a guy that once stole boots from Dark Vlad. You know how it is with those foot fetishists, right? Knowing Dark Vlad left, we want to move on, but we can only find the next point he went to by seeing the boots. Oh my god. Do I have a foot fetish? And to be allowed to see them, we have to join the Order of the Kicked Asses. So then for the quest, who kicked the kicked asses ass, we craft some other boots for him and as a result we can continue on our journey because he shows us Dark Vlad's boots. The compass points to a new direction for the quest, the Soul Stealer. We then find Tongasi on the island Pandala. Remember, it's the place I recently described much simpler as Asia. She wants to prove herself as a shaman. Sh sh shaman. I, there's no way either of those pronunciations were correct. So she has to fight an evil spirit. Somehow all that is linked to Dark Vlad, by the way, obviously. We need to give her a hand by capturing the dungeon keeper souls needed for the summoning ritual, which we already did, baby. So she summons the evil spirit, we defeat it, and it tells us what the deal is with him being evil and all. So he was called Your Solis Mineo. What the fuck? He had a deal with the evil lord. Dark Vlad wanted to get his hands back on the Emerald Dofus, and in exchange, he awoke the spirits of the dead. Instead of those dead spirits obeying your souls, Minayo, they killed him. Who could have seen that coming? Anyway, that kind of upset him, which I don't even think is too far fetched of a reaction. But then the compass starts spinning again, and we stop giving a fuck. <laughs> so we're taking to another location. Nabber's Lost Love, the next quest, is a lot. Let me try and summarize as quick as I can. We get to some grave where someone saw Dark Vlad do something with someone's grave. Nabur's apparently someone that Dark Vlad killed. Nabur's ghost then left. We found him in an abandoned and destroyed village where he was troubled with how his wife and kid are doing upon seeing the destruction, since they lived there and stuff. Then we agree to help him find his family. We find out his family survived the obliteration. He goes to and finds the grave of his wife, where his great 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 granddaughter is also chilling at and can finally find peace being buried with the love of his life. What does that have to do with Dark Vlad? I don't know, but it's in the cemetery! <laughs> Then we find some racist grandpa and Bonta. This shit is crazy. <laughs> He's like against the entirety of the IOP class because Dark Vlad is an IOP. Trust me, I will do anything but go in depth with the story again on that one. But we can finish the quest very easily because we already had the prerequisites of breeding mounts and knowing mount tame. Three quests left. My god. Coming off that high of so much progress, we're on one of the hardest quests now, the Kanya Bandits. For every one of the bounties we did, we get one bountykin from Bounty Hunter. Then we trade the 15 bountykins for a treasure map to start a legendary treasure hunt. The first part of that is manageable enough. We follow hints to essentially find the X on the treasure map. This leads us to the aforementioned Kanya Bandits, who are in possession of some cool ass dragon scales that we need for a talisman since Dark Vlad turned out to be much stronger than we thought, and the talisman should somehow help with that. Here's the problem though, all three of these guys have over 10,000 HP, and on top of that, despite being level 100, they can all deal more than 1,000 damage per turn. So, I don't know how it's supposed to work, but it boils down to us having no chance. So what do we do? Well, we pay some stranger stronger than us for help, because otherwise we'd be stuck on this step of the quest till, I don't know, like level 150? And that's just not fun. Also, maybe I should point out by saying I'm paying someone for help, what I actually mean is I pay myself on another account to help, an account that's not part of this challenge. This is because I hate asking people for help, and I like making sure my teammate I'm paying isn't a complete idiot, and speaks my language. Two things that are not guaranteed in Dofus. And hey, with the help of a level 200 character, we beat the legendary treasure hunt three times. Since the legendary treasure hunts take a lot of time, I've only now been able to finish the last one. But that settles the quest. 
The second to last quest, Draconthropy, requires us to complete the Moo Wolf dungeon. This is to get the last item we need to complete crafting this talisman. And in fact, this is the last dungeon we'll do during this adventure. And it was quite hard, but nothing special. It was a good time, almost failed, but hey, first try still. I just did a few too many dungeons this video to still be excited. What's even more important than some dungeon though is that we're now ready for the last quest of the Emerald Dofus. And now that, yeah, that gets me excited. I say that sentence, I just got chills. <laughs> two sets are still missing, but thank God I have enough money now to craft the Panda and Osa sets. They're really strong too, but cost quite a bit. I also started maging them, which took until... Getting proper mages is harder the higher level the items are since they give more and different stats, but I think I did a much better job than last time. Basically, I was just more patient and invested more money. I tested out the sets real quick, which impressed me, like, goddamn, these new damage spikes are always exciting. Monkey brain, love big number. But then it was time to finally visit Mariana for the last time. Mariana puts together the talisman for us, and after the whole wild goose chase over Ankama, she says she has been gathering information. I took a lot of energy, but I finally succeeded in locating Dark Vlad, more or less. What did I do all that other stuff for? He's very far from here. He's left the world of 12 to go to the celestial island of Incarnam. Not gonna lie, that shit caught me off guard the first time around. According to legend, Incarnam rests on the back of Prismeradoth. That is literally the dragon whose skills are in our talisman. And apparently that'll improve the power of it even further. Sorry, when I explained Incarnam, I didn't really mention the fact that it's built on top of a dragon, did I? Yeah, makes the place sound a little more badass than calling it yellow. <laughs> so we head back to Incarnam, a place I have not been to in almost 100 days. Man, what a journey it's been. Both a fun and a frustrating one. And how I fare in this difficult quest, this single one after so many quests will be the culmination of this entire story. The Emerald Sofa. Yeah! <laughs> We walk back one big cannonball. Ahem. <clears throat> right, ahem. <clears throat> Time to, uh, kill Dark Vlad, huh? We find out he's indeed in Incarnam. The militia chief tells us how he was in the Incarnam cemetery. Didn't do it. There we encounter three bandits who apparently also helped Dark Vlad get the Emerald Dofus back. Clearly they aren't on good terms either as Throbbing Ed tells us voluntarily that he went quote to the end of the world to the tip of the dragon's tail. Man that sounds badass for a finale. So we head to the flight zone where we get on a balloon that lowers us to the dragon's tail below. This is it. Here in Inknam where it all started. We're finally about to face Dark Vlad. Right here with the Emerald Dofus in arm's reach. This fight is anything but easy. It's essentially more of a puzzle. The talisman transforms us into a rainbow dragon that is strong enough to beat Dark Vlad. Because of this transformation, we have limited moves, all with annoying cooldowns. It's super easy to fail this battle, even after I literally watched the guide, but there's nothing left other than trying. It isn't going well. I'm not a bad strategist, but 
This fight can still be so fucking frustrating because it's kind of RNG based. But maybe it's also the pressure of a 200 hour challenge behind me since I have yet to beat this fight one of four times. On attempt three, things go very promising again. He uses spells I can get away from easily so he doesn't hit me and I keep my distance which is essential here. And lo and behold, I managed to kill Dark Vlad on my Osa. The first one to finish the quest line. And no, no. That's not it, of course, because I had to somehow do this fight again three more times. It's what I would say if I was any longer worried on the other three characters, my Craw, my Hopper Mage, and my Panda War. I now managed to beat the fight first try. No, I am not kidding. I guess I'm not so bad at strategy after all. So there it is. Dark Vlad is defeated. And on day 99, I have not only reached level 100, not only come up with a sick ass set, but I've acquired the Emerald fucking Dofus. So what do I use day 100 for? It's time to celebrate, of course, by maging my sets more. So there it is then, 100 days a total of 211 hours spending the last ones just trying to perfect my set and this is the result with my four characters perfected as far as i possibly could i realized that i've only been pushing through achieving this because i wanted to prove to my friend and to you watching that i can do a good job in this game but do i really need that external validation my own approval is what counts most. My goal was to have a good time, and that's sure as hell what I've had. Isn't that enough? I think honestly, it is. But you know what would be even better? Finally getting 30 out of 40 points! I see that there's no glaring mistakes. That looks great. I actually quite like this set. I would actually give this, for the first time, 9.9 .9 just because no cosmetics. Let's go! <laughs> okay. So, no complaints for me. Yeah. This seems fine. I just know if I spend 30 minutes uh, obsessing over gear, I can make small optimizations, but it's pretty good. So I'll give it 9.4. This one's pretty good as well. 9.4. Oh my god, we're off to a very good start <laughs> here. Yeah, this one this one could have been much better. I'm gonna judge it a not too harshly, but a little bit harshly. I'm gonna say 7.8. Honestly, one. this set is very, very normal. No worries, this set is actually okay. Bye. I'll give this a solid 9.1. 9. Actually, 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. That is good for me. You gave me 9.9 .9 points for my crawl, 9.4 Hopper, 7.8 Osa, and a 9 out of 10 for the Panna, putting us at a grand total of, let me calculate in my head, and now with a calculator, 36.1 points. Damn. God damn, that is an average of 9.025 points per character. So and happy. if ever you decide to continue these characters, I'm happy to uh, reevaluate your set choices. So wait, I have a question. So, so will this conversation be the closing conversation on the video? Basically.